Hi, through this video we are going to continue with optimal control for discrete time systems. It's only that now we are starting another approach called indirect approach. In particular, we are going to derive first order necessary conditions of optimality for a general nonlinear problem here. And then we are going to specialize the results to the popular LQ setting. That means linear system and a quadratic uh, cost function. So let's uh, recap the basic setup here. Our cost function is composed of the term that penalizes the state at the final time m and then uh, the so-called running cost, which uh, contains terms penalizing both the state and the control. So terminal cost and the running cost. Note that since the initial time here is labeled as i, we will include this in the name of the cost function. Now, depending on how we choose uh, phi and, uh, and L, we obtain different cost functions. For instance, minimum time, minimum fuel, minimum energy. And the very popular LQ cost function. Uh, this is again formed by creating these uh, quadratic matri matrix forms that penalize together the state and the control, control signal. Therefore, the problem for us now is to minimize j over x and u such that n, x and u comply with the constraints and the constraints are given uh, directly by the state equation. The initial state is given. Note that in what we are going to develop in this video and the next, we are not going to consider inequality type constraints. So now the promised first order necessary conditions of optimality. First, as we did in uh, constraint optimization, we form the augmented cost function. We take the original cost function and add a linear combination of the constraint functions. Now I will reformat this augmented cost function such that the structure is perhaps better displayed. And now a word on uh, terminology. Indeed, we will call this augmented cost function, even though you may recall from our introduction to optimization that this should perhaps called uh, Lagrangian function. The trouble, however, is that in control theory and dynamical systems uh, we use the term Lagrangian for something slightly different. Another convention that we'll make here is that I will relabel lambda k to lambda k plus 1 just for aesthetics reasons. And another notational issue here is that I will now take all this term here and uh, label it as h. This we will call uh, Hamiltonian, you may find some resemblance with the Hamiltonian that you are familiar with from physics. However, there is some slight discrepancy with the signs here. That's why it should be perhaps better called control Hamiltonian. But we will make some more comments on this later in this course. Then uh, with this new conventions, I will rewrite the cost function in the following form using H and relying on increasing the indices of lambdas. And I will do one more uh, restructuring of, these form, of this expression such that the terms that correspond to the final time are coming together. The terms, or actually the term that corresponds to the initial time, stands separately. And then finally, all the terms that correspond to the running cost. All right. Now, now that we have this uh, augmented cost function, we know what uh, needs to be done, right? We now need to find the gradient of this augmented cost function and uh, set it equal to zero and solve for all the variables. And this way we will obtain the uh, critical point, the candidate for the optimal solution. And a good advice here is rather than aiming directly for uh, gradients, is to solve or to find the differential and then once we have it we will be able to identify the derivatives hence the gradients. So let's go for it. So I know that the differential being the first order approximation to the increment in the cost function 
if I perturb the or the variables looks like looks like this. I still do not know the content of these uh, of these round brackets here, but we will fill them in immediately. Just pay attention to the lower and upper bounds on the on the summation, the individual terms. All right now, filling in the content for these uh, brackets is straightforward. So I will have a gradient of 5 with respect to xn minus lambda n. Note that a gradient in our course is uh, regarded a column vector. So, and the last term here, just uh, I should uh, lay, I should put here all the sub indices for h. And now I'm essentially done. Now the condition of optimality, or actually the condition for a critical point, is that the differential is equal to zero. But then, if I now have a look at the last term, uh, then if uh, differential lambda k is arbitrary, then the content of the brackets must be zero. And after relabeling the indices to make it a little bit more familiar, this is what I get. Then for the first term on the second line, this is what I get. And this is for the middle term on the second line. And then the first line here, so first the ter what corresponds to, to the initial state. In fact here, unless I really specified that the initial state is fixed, I need to put the whole term here. So the whole product ne needs to be equal to zero. And then the very first term on the first line gives me this. And that's essentially it. Uh, this is the set of... Uh, conditions that give me first order conditions of optimality. Let's now elaborate a little bit more on them. The first equation can be written directly as the state equation. The second one is the gradient of L with respect to xk plus gradient of the of the inner product of uh, lambda and f. But how do we compute this one? Let's let me make uh, some side computation here. So the inner product of lambda and f can be written as a sum of products of the corresponding terms. And since the gradient is a linear function, I can write it like, like a linear combination of individual gradients. But now, how do I put it back into the formula here? Well, I need to, I need to uh, continue one more, one more step here. So, if I now introduce a new matrix composed of the individual columns of the individual gradients and I will label this matrix as uh, nabla f, then this is how I can write the second and the third term here as well. Note that nabla f is now a matrix, it's actually a transpose of a Jacobian matrix. Now, all these first three conditions are actually representing a bunch of equations parametrized by the discrete time k. And now note that for the second equation I can include somewhat arbitrarily uh, another lambda, which I will not use later, just in order to make all these three equations starting with k at i. And now uh, concerning the fourth uh, inequality for a fixed, ta for a fixed initial state, I can replace the whole condition just by the condition that the initial state is give, is equal to R. And now the final condition here, if uh, the final state is fixed, that means the differential is equal to zero, then I can again ignore the whole condition and instead of this I will uh, introduce the condition that Xn is equal to Rn. And in the situation that the final state is not specified, that means the, its differential is not zero, then it must be the second term in the product that is equal to zero. Hence, two possibilities for the condition. And that's essentially it. Uh, this is one of the crucial results that we achieved in this, uh, in this uh, lecture. Let's now specialize these two linear systems with quadratic cost functions. As usual, the cost function then contains the term penalizing the, the state at the final time. Sorry for the typo, I omitted xn. And the running cost. 
Now, all the three matrices Q, R, and S should be non-negative. Uh, these are necessary conditions for minimality, right? But as you will see later, for R matrix, we require even something more. We want to have strict positivity. Name, uh, in particular, uh, positive definiteness. Now, this is the Hamiltonian. And writing down the first order necessary conditions of optimality is as easy as, uh, as finding the gradients of Hamiltonian with respect to all the necessary variables. So the first equation is actually a state equation, right? There's nothing to compute here. The second equation, so-called co-state equation, can be computed as a gradient of h with respect to x. So for the first term here is q times xk plus, and now the gradient of this product over here is lambda transpose times lambda k plus 1. And the third equation, called the stationarity equation, is 0 is equal to gradient of h with respect to u, which goes like this. And then the initial condition is well, again, a typo here, it should be R0. And the, the final condition is then given in one of these two formats. Either the state at the final time is given or the co-state lambda at the final time is given as a linear transformation of the state at the final time. Now, from the stationarity equation, I can extract, I can solve for u, provided r is non-singular, and here you, you see why we required r being strictly greater than zero, positive definite. And then I substitute into the first equation, and this is what I get. I, this way I essentially eliminate controls, and this is what I get. So this looks like a dynamical system with two state variables or actually state and co-state variable and the initial conditions are standard and the final conditions are coming in one of the two forms. Now this is something called a two-point boundary value problem and unlike the initial value problem with which you are already familiar here the Trouble is actually coming from the fact that part of the uh, values are given at the initial time and some other uh, conditions are imposed at the final time. And this makes analysis of these problems somewhat more involved. However, you will see in the next videos how we can handle this.